That's a little hypnotic. It kind of gets me feeling like a, little, like a snake being trained. I start <laughs> swaying back and forth. I'm not sure I can do that for four straight weeks. Well, how are you guys doing? And, well, see, I got a better response than you, you do. Look at there. <laughs> Traitors. <laughs> I, I'm Nathan, and I'm the lead pastor here. You guys have already heard from Chris. He's our associate pastor. We're doing something a little different today. We're both preaching together. We'll see if Chris can actually stay in his seat for 30 minutes. That'll be the trick. If he screams and starts running around on the stage, you'll know he had to get up and move around. But today we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called Games We Play, where we're looking at some popular games and using them as an illustration or a picture of what a Christian's life should look like. And today we're using the game Twister to kind of talk about what we want our church to look like in 2024. Who's played Twister? Yeah, almost everybody. It's been around longer than I have. And, you know, I'm going to be honest. I think it takes an Olympic gymnast or a yoga instruction, uh, instructor to be good at it. Uh, this is going to come as a shock to you, but I am not the most limber or flexible person. Shocking, <laughs> I know. But I don't actually think that the goal of the game is to win I think the goal of the game is for somebody to lose and to embarrass themselves along the way. Playing Twister by yourself would be a whole lot easier. Man, I could do that for hours. I could spin that little dial and just kind of move a foot from blue to green or move a hand, right? It would be so much easier. But that's not how the game is designed to be played. It's designed to be played as a group where we have to interact with one another. We have to bend and flex around each other and twist. It's not called the game Twister for nothing. Well, if you're a follower of Jesus, following Jesus is kind of like playing Twister in that we have to be connected with other people. If you're doing Christianity right, if you're being a follower of Jesus, the intention from the very beginning is that we are all connected together in community, in a biblical community called a church. Church is not a time of the week. It is not a particular place Church is a group of people who are gathered together for a very specific purpose, and that's to make and grow disciples or followers of Jesus. And so if you've been around Karis City for a while, you know our mission statement. You've probably heard us say it more than once. We want to be a church that shows intentional grace to others one person at a time. And our, our thought process on that is if we show intentional grace the way we're supposed to, it will draw people to this place so that they can hear about Jesus and they can hopefully have a relationship with Jesus and then we can grow in that relationship. And so as we begin 2024, we want to be a church who continues to grow in our mission, who continues to look more and more like Jesus in the way that we show intentional grace to others. And then that allows Jesus to use his grace and his sacrifice and love to transform people's lives and change their eternities. Now, Twister is a really simple game if you look at the rules. Spin the dial, move your hand or your feet to a different color, don't fall down. It's that simple. But it gets a lot more complex when you add other people into the mix. It gets harder than it sounds. Like Twister, our church's mission is very simple. Our church's mission is to show intentional grace to other people one person at a time. And that's an easy statement, but it gets more complicated when there's lots of us and we are involved with our community and all these people are different and interacting. So going into 2024, we want to help you grow in the mission. Chris and I cannot help you grow in playing the game of Twister. Neither one of us are Olympic champions. Neither one of us are yoga instructions. I know that's a shock that we're not. Chris does good at lunch just to not spill something uh, all over him. I have no trouble with that. We don't lie in church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually have a game where at lunch we see who's the first one to drop something on their shirt and then who does it the worst. And so we see who we, he usually wins the game. But we can't help you grow in Twister, but we can hopefully help us grow in our mission as a church to show intentional grace to others. And so that's what we want to do. So if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Colossians chapter 3. Now, if you're not familiar with the book of Colossians, it is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. He wrote it in somewhere around AD 60 to 61 while he was imprisoned in Rome. And the church in Colossae is not a church that Paul was ever able to visit in person, but it's a church that was really important to him, and he felt the need to write a letter to them. And the reason for this was is he wanted to fight against a heresy that was being spread, a false teaching that Jesus was not the Son of God. 
But he also uses this letter as an opportunity while he's got their attention to teach the Colossians about kind of the basics of faith and what it looks, out to, looks like to live out that faith in the context of biblical community. And so that's what we're going to take a look at today is this section on biblical community. So we're going to start by looking at verse 12 and just the first half here. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, and we're going to stop right there. Now, this phrase that Paul uses is incredibly important for a couple of reasons. One, it establishes a key principle about who we are as Christians, but it also leads to our first truth for the day, and that's that you were made to play. The word that Paul uses for chosen people here in the Greek is a word called eklektos, and what eklektos means is a group of people who are chosen or called for a special purpose by God. And so what Paul is trying to help us understand is that our faith is not just about getting to eternity, but that our faith actually leads us to a grand design and grand purpose for our lives on earth that directly impacts the eternity of other people. And so this purpose, we need to establish what it is. Well, Jesus talked about this purpose with his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And you've often heard these verses referred to as the Great Commission. And this is what Jesus said. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. As a follower of Christ, as a Christian, you are not only created, but called to directly impact the lives of people. You were called to help change people's eternities in the same way that your eternity has been changed. And I get it that initially that sounds shocking and it's kind of scary because that's a huge responsibility. But it is also a great duty and honor that we have as Christians that just as we've been changed by the gospel, we help change other people through the gospel. But we make this kind of impact that Jesus made the same way that Jesus made it by sharing intentional grace and being involved in the lives of others and showing them the love of Jesus and the truth of Jesus. When Paul calls us God's chosen people, he's not just talking about we're chosen to go to heaven. He is saying that we have been chosen to be part of Jesus' plan and his mission to transform other people through the intentional grace of God to us and through intentional grace from us to other people. And so as a Christian, you cannot fulfill your mission unless you are engaged with other people. Uh, unless you are serving and loving and investing in other people's lives, you cannot fulfill your mission. And, and so Jesus has called you to so much more than just kind of slipping in and out of a worship service on Sunday mornings. He's called you to be a part of changing the world one person at a time. What greater mission could that be than to change the world? So I want to look at our verses and look back at verse 12 together. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So Paul is going to transition from preaching to us about what our identity is as God's chosen people to becoming a teacher. And he's going to teach us about what it looks like to interact with each other and how we're supposed to live. And so he says that we are to clothe ourselves or to put on five different traits or characteristics that make us look like Jesus and help us interact with one another better. And the first two of these deal directly with how we care for one another. And that's compassion and kindness. And those two words lead us to our second main truth for the day. Embracing others is part of the game. You cannot play the game of being a Christian. You cannot be a follower of Jesus without embracing others. Look, Twister is not a game for people that have space issues. Like if you're worried about your personal space, don't play Twister. If you're a germaphobe, try Monopoly. It's going to work way better for you. You have to get up close and personal when you play the game Twister. And being a follower of Jesus and living out intentional grace works the same way. If you want to fulfill your mission, you've got to share intentional grace by getting in people's lives, embracing them with compassion and kindness. And the compassion that Paul is talking about here is not like a personal liking or affinity. It's something much deeper than that. It is a deep sympathy for other people. 
If you look at the original Greek word that Paul uses, he, he uses a word that, that makes it clear that he is telling us that we have to have a heart of compassion. In, in other words, we've got to have a really soft spot for God's creation of mankind. You know, Nathan, I, I don't know how often you think about the purpose of TV commercials. Not but very they, often. They really exist for two reasons. I don't know how often you guys think about this, but you're going to learn it right now. The first one is they, they stick with you. They're made to stick with you. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to just list off a few examples for you. All states mayhem. Everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say that. Geico, the, the, not, you know, the gecko and the cavemen, J.G. Wentworth and the Vikings, commercials are made to stick in your brain. But they're also made to move you to action, right? They have a purpose, and that goal is usually to get you to do something. And I don't think there's a commercial that accomplishes this any better than a commercial made by the Humane Society ASPCA. In 2007, they decided to create a TV commercial about animal cruelty. Some of you have already figured out where I'm going with this. And, and if you've never seen this commercial, first off, you clearly don't turn on the television because it's everywhere. It's been around for 17 years, and it's still around. They still play it. And what they did with this commercial is they took pictures and videos of abused animals, and they show them to you. But then they take it a step further with the, the drama, and they take the song, In the Arms of an Angel, by Sarah McLaughlin, and they put it over this video, and it becomes this thing that you have no desire to watch. You don't want to watch it, but you can't help but watch it. And what's really interesting about it to me is that I don't think I know a single person that doesn't have empathy and doesn't feel sympathy for the animals when they watch that commercial. Because even if you don't really care about animals, you can't help but feel to be moved to act when you see the needs that they have. Yeah, and that's the kind of compassion that Paul's talking about. It is this compassion, this heart that moves us into action. If compassion does not move us into action, well, we don't have compassion like what Paul's talking about. And, and then this ties directly into Paul's next word or his next trait, kindness. The, the Greek word that Paul uses for kindness has a much deeper meaning than being nice. In fact, sometimes being kind is not being nice. Kindness is living a life of concern to others. If you are living out kindness, you don't have to tell people you're a kind person. They know because you have deep empathy and deep care for other people. Having kindness means that we don't just talk the talk of kindness. We walk the walk of kindness. We live that out. When we have a heart for other people, like Jesus has a heart for us, it will change the way that we interact. And he here's how. We don't choose to help and serve other people because they've earned it from us. We don't do that because they deserve it. We do it because we see a deep need, just like that commercial we see a need that moves us into action because that's what God did for us. We did not deserve what Jesus did for us on the cross. We didn't earn that. But God saw a deep need within us to connect with God the Father, and so he sent his only son to die to meet that need. So that's the example of kindness and compassion that we're supposed to have, that sacrifice. Look, we don't want to just be a thoughts and prayers church. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but a, a church that goes, oh, yeah, we're, we're thinking about you. We'll pray for you, and that's all you ever do. We want to be a church that's in the trenches, living life with people, serving them, helping care for them, meeting their needs. We want to be a group of Christ followers that is active in our community and active in taking care of one another. That's the intentional grace that God showed to us and so it's the intentional grace that we're to show one another and the world around us. See, when we have a heart for other people like Jesus has for us, it helps us want to share the grace and the truth of Jesus. Not, not because people have earned it, not because they have deserved it, because we know they have that great need. And, and if you've been at Kara City a little while, I hope you've gotten to see some of that in action. Yeah, you know, it really is kind of mind-blowing to see the ways that we've been able to display the love of Jesus for a church our size. Uh, just share a little bit of information with you guys. In 2023 alone, our church gave $70,805 towards missions and benevolence, uh, which is absolutely incredible. Yeah, you can clap for that. And statistically, here's what this means. It means that 19.25% of the entire giving towards the church went right back out the door to help those in need which is incredible. 
And what's really neat is this is an area that we're actually growing in as a church. In 2022, we gave 13.97% of our total giving towards missions and benevolence, which means that this year we gave 5.28% more than last year, which is absolutely incredible. But we didn't just help meet needs and show the love of Jesus through giving. We also added a missions partner this year. We partnered with Two Lives Change this past year, adding our total missions organizations that we help uh, up to four, which is absolutely incredible. And we've gotten to help different families and individuals who are in need. We've helped provide food and clothing and housing and different kinds of support for people who needed this help. And what's really cool is this isn't just the church staff going and taking the budget and going and spending it and doing things for people. You guys played a massive part in this. Not only were you generous, but you served faithfully. And because of, yeah, we can clap for that. Because of what you guys did, we were able to extravagantly display the love of Jesus this year and help change people's situations and their lives. And it's amazing to see the way that our church has rallied around other people. But in the same way that we saw a great need for the love of Jesus, what's really amazing to me is that we also saw a great and deep need for the truth of Jesus. We saw a deep need in others for, a, for hope and for life change. And because we wanted to share the truth of Jesus with them, we did. We showed them the love of Jesus and we got to share the truth of God's word with them. And because of that, eternities were changed. And we got to celebrate this past year 20 baptisms as a church which is amazing for a church our size. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think about the baptisms that we've had since we started. The first year we started, I think we had two. Yeah. And then last, the 2022, we had nine. And then in 2023, we had 20, which I don't know if you appreciate the significance of it, but for a church our size, that's, that's pretty incredible. And see, that's how it works. When we love and we serve other people, when we show intentional grace, we get to play a part in God's mission to transform lives and to change eternities. And here's the challenge for us. As excited as I am about what happened in 2023, these are still areas where we can grow as a church, where we can do better. We can be even more compassionate and more kind as a church in 2024. And here's some practical ways that you can be a part of helping Kara City do those things. I, I want to challenge you to be even more generous in 2024 with your time, with your energy, with your talents, and with your resources. Because when you are generous with God at Kara City with all of those things, it lets us show intentional grace in even greater ways, impact more people so that they see the love of Jesus through us. But I also want to challenge you to be more active in serving in 2024. Be a part of serving on Sunday mornings here at Kara City. Be a part of our mission connections because we are active with local missions around us. And you can play a big part in helping us show that intentional grace as a church. Yeah, you know, one of the best ways you guys can get started with this, if you're not a part of it, is serving with suppers and showers. I talked to you about it a little bit earlier this morning, but it really is a great way to get plugged into serving. Typically, we do it twice a month, so you've got plenty of opportunity, and it's an amazing ministry that we get to serve the homeless and meet some amazing people. And so if you're not a part of that, that's one way I would challenge you to do this. But just like Nathan did, I want to challenge you, man, be a part of what's going on here at Kara City as well. Be a part of the serving teams that we have, all the different ministry areas that we have for you guys to serve in, because you help us drive the mission of Kara City forward. You know, one area that we really want to expand upon in 2024 with our teams is guest services. We want people to feel loved and welcomed from the second they pull into our parking lot. And so that's actually an area that we want to grow in, in the parking lot. We want to start being able to have first-time guest parking and have a full team that helps welcome and direct people into service because we believe this is important to us. And so if you want to be a part of that, do me a favor after service. Adam will be at the Connect booth. Just go stop by and talk with him because we need your help to make people feel welcome here at Karis City. But as important as it is for us to show the love of Jesus, I also want to remind you that it's important that we show the truth of Jesus as well. And so I want to challenge you in this. I would challenge you to share your faith. Easy ways you guys can do that. And talk about what you believe and why you believe it with someone. Have a conversation with someone and share the story of how you came to follow Jesus and how your life looks differently now. Disciple people that are new to the faith and help them grow in their faith and you can even do something as simple as inviting people to church because that plays a part in helping change their eternities. But whatever it looks like for you this year, 
take steps to grow in compassion and kindness because this is important. We've done amazing things as a church in 2023 and the years past, and it really is kind of mind-blowing to look at what we've been able to do for the kingdom. But what excites me and should also challenge us is that we have an opportunity in 2024 to make a way bigger impact than we even made this past year. And so I want to challenge you to have a heart for people like Jesus did and let that lead you to action as we meet their needs. Now, Paul's going to finish out verse 12 by talking about the qualities of uh, humility, gentleness, and patience. And so for Paul, humility really leads to gentleness and patience. They are qualities that are linked to and a direct result of humility. And so these principles actually lead us to our third principle for the day, our third truth, and that is that the low man always wins. Now, Twister is a game that really is all about leverage. If you're the high man in the game, the man on top, in theory, you think that'd be good for you, but it doesn't work out for you, right? Because things may go well for you in the beginning, but eventually, you're going to have a moment where there's this dot way across the, the, you know, the mat, and you're going to have to reach around and through and back over trying to get to someone, and it's going to end in disaster. But if you're the low man, you got the leverage. You've got the advantage, and so there is a benefit to playing the game from the right vantage point. And so living out intentional grace works a lot in the same way. We have to be the low man. We have to live out humility because it is a key virtue of us as a follower of Christ. And this humility that Paul talks about is directly tied to this idea of a full submission to God's plan for you, your faith, and his community. And so we want to break this down a little bit with you. The first thing is, is that humility changes how we interact with other people. Growing in humility means that we actually take the low place in our relationships with others. And Paul actually gave us an example of this back in Philippians 2 by looking at the example that Jesus set for us. And we'll look at that in verses 5 through 8. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus gave us the greatest example of humility that anybody ever could. Because if there's anyone who had every right to live and act in ways that's superior to other people, it's Jesus, right? But Jesus chose to be a servant who sacrificed for the good of others. And that's the same level of humility that we're supposed to have, that we are called to be servants. And so just as Jesus submitted to God's plan for redemption, we are to submit to God's design and plan for faith and walking out faith with other believers. And so what this means for us is that if we're gonna live out intentional grace, if we're going to be a group of people who are deeply invested and involved in the lives of others, and we want to play a part in changing people's eternities, we have to serve. Yeah. You cannot be a servant of Jesus without humbly serving his people. Just can't. You cannot do it because that's not how, how it works. Serving isn't some like advanced level or advanced class of Christianity. It's Christianity 101. It is the basic calling that we are called to when we follow after Jesus. But now here's the cool part. When you begin to humbly serve other people, you're going to begin to grow in these traits of gentleness and patience. It just naturally happens. Look, at first, you're going to have to make a conscious decision to humbly serve other people. But over time, humility is going to become second nature to you. It's going to become who you are. And then out of that humility flows these traits of gentleness and patience. The Greek words that's translated into gentleness describes like a mildness in a nature. And literally it translates to having soft edges. And, and that you can kind of visualize what that looks like. It means that we're not harsh in our relationships with other people. It means that we're not always looking out for our own interests. But instead, we're focusing on what's best for them, on their interests. And then the Greek word that Paul uses for patience is also, also translated a lot of times as long-suffering. And long-suffering is one of those words that kind of defines itself, that you suffer a long time before you get upset. 
And, and so patience is this idea that because we are humble in our dealings with other people, it softens our response, it slows down our response, we're quick to listen, we're slow to speak, we're very slow to get angry, and then we're quick at letting that anger go. It softens the harshness about us. And, and so if you want to grow in humility, if you want to grow in patience and in uh, long-suffering, the way you do that is you humbly serve other people. And if you do that, then Jesus will transform who you are, and you'll start to see these things as gentleness and patience just come second nature to you because Humility will become who you are. But humility isn't just about our interactions with other people. It would be great if it was. But the biggest part of humility is submitting to God's will and his plan for our lives. And, and if we're honest with one another, man, that's the toughest part of humility because we want to do it our way. But humility says, I'm going to do it God's way. Listen to what God's plan is. That's what humility is, and what makes it so hard is it's actually complete surrender to Jesus. Yeah, you know, so often we want to pick and choose the areas of our life and faith that we submit to God. But the reality is, is that it doesn't work that way. True submission to God means full submission to God. And so if we're going to humbly submit ourselves to him, that means that we have to give him full control over the direction of our lives. And if we're being honest with ourselves, that's a little terrifying at first. But the truth is, is that this is actually for our benefit. Does anybody love sushi here? Okay, I'll pray for the rest of you. It's okay. Uh, for those of you that love sushi, let's be real. Sushi is something that people are very picky about. Okay, I love sushi. In particular, I love raw tuna. It's delicious. But raw salmon? Mm -mm. Cannot do it. It's like chewing a fishy gumball that gets bigger as I chew. And so I want nothing to do with it. If I have the choice, I'm picking tuna over salmon all day long. But here's what's interesting, is that if you want like a true, traditional Japanese sushi dining experience, you don't get the pick. If you want the real deal, you go have what's called omakase. And omakase, that word literally translates to, I leave it up to you. And so what happens is you go into this restaurant, you sit down at the sushi bar at this counter, and he starts serving you food. You have no control over what he gives you. It's just totally up to the chef and whatever they've prepared for the day. Now, that sounds a little terrifying, but if you're choosing to eat omakase, you have to trust that this sushi chef knows what they're doing, that these, these chefs have been trained in traditional techniques that have been around for centuries and centuries. And so you have to trust that they know how to curate these bites in a way that all work beautifully together. And what's so neat to me is this experience is considered so special that for the highest end omakases, it's not uncommon for you to have to wait on a list for years and pay thousands of dollars just to eat at one of those restaurants. See, the cost is high and you have no control, but it's an experience like no other. See, true humility, true submission to God works in the same way because true submission is a full submission to God's plan and design for your life, that you give him every area of your life to guide and direct. But we can also trust that in this submission, in this surrender, that God's gonna take care of us because we can trust that God knows what he's doing Romans 8.28 actually says it this way. It says that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So the question is, do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? That he is part of the God who created the universe, who made everything, who created you, and who loves you desperately and wants what's best for you? Because if you do, if you believe that, then you can submit to him because you know he's got your interests at heart. You submit to his plan. And, and so here's the thing. Being a follower of Jesus, a true follower of Jesus, requires complete surrender, not half-hearted compliance. 
So here's what that looks like for you as part of Kara City in 2024. Don't just attend church, be the church. Be a part of this community of believers who is working to grow together and to share the mission of God together to change the world one person at a time. Be a part of a community group. We're starting community groups back up this week. It's a great time to get connected with one where you meet in homes, get better connected to take care of one another, study God's word in a small group, have dinner, and really just get to know the people in our church. Be part of this community. Serve sacrificially here at church and with our mission organizations. Give generously back to God to support the mission. Invite other people to church. Tell other people about your faith. Help mentor and support and encourage other people here at Kara City. When you fully submit to God's plan, you get to be a part of this amazing mission to change the world. That's how it works. And as I think about all we've accomplished in the two and a half years that we've been a church, here's the thing. I'm excited about that, but we've barely scratched the surface. Surface, we're just getting started. If we'll humbly submit to God's plan, and we'll be the kind of church and the kind of Christians he's calling us to be. We're going to be blown away with what God does this next year. But for us to reach that potential, it can't just be the church staff. It can't just be the staff and some key leaders doing these things. The Bible is clear that every part of the church is important. And if we're going to accomplish our mission, you are critical to that mission. And if we do that... We're going to be amazed because we're one church. We are one group of people called to one single mission. So ask yourself this question. Where do I need to submit more fully to God in 2024? Maybe that's being more generous with your time, with some talents that you have that you've not even told anybody you have yet. Maybe that's being more generous in supporting the mission and giving back to God. Where do you need to grow in humility? Where do you need to grow in these traits that helps you look more like Jesus and helps you show intentional grace to others? Whatever that looks like then, make a commitment to God to submit to him in that. If you will do that, we're going to be amazed at what God does in us and through us this next year. Well, let's look at our last verses in our passage. This is verses 13 through 14. And Paul writes, Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. So with these verses, Paul's going to make his shift from teacher back to preacher Paul as he wraps up this call to live with intentional grace. And I love that he ends with the virtues of forgiveness and love because really, and these are central to our faith, and also with that, they tie directly into our last truth, and that truth is that falling isn't the end of the game. Now, Twister is a difficult game, right? Even if you're playing the game and things are going really well for you in that moment, all it takes is for that little arrow to go from right-hand green to left foot green. And suddenly, this perfect strategy that you've crafted crumbles as you come tipping over. But if we're honest with ourselves, that's kind of part of the game, right? Falling is part of Twister. It, I'm, it's I'm, really, I'm really good at that part. Me too. That's I'm close. But, but falling, it's, it's part of the game. And so what happens is you don't fall and then get up and get angry and crumble that mat up and throw it back in the box, stomp on it, toss it in the trash, and never play Twister again. I mean, I did, but you don't because you're good Christians. But no, what you do is you get helped back up and you play the game again because that's how you play Twister. Similarly to that, if we're living out intentional grace with others, you need to understand it's not always going to work in our favor that something has the potential to go wrong because we're imperfect people who are constantly capable of sin. And so no matter how perfect a strategy that you plan up, no matter how much you try to prepare for it and avoid it, someone's going to mess up whether that's you or someone else. It doesn't work out perfectly. But this is why Paul wraps up with the ideas of forgiveness and love. Because we may not be perfect, but we worship and serve the perfect God who loved and forgave us first. And so just as we are forgiven, we are to forgive others. 
And Paul actually gives this exact command to the Ephesian Christians when he talked with them about biblical community in Ephesians 4.32. He said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Sin isn't the end of our relationship with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because of what he did, his forgiveness makes it where even when we sin, that's not the end of our relationship. And sin also shouldn't be the end of our relationship with one another. You know, I'm always a little surprised when I hear somebody telling me about church and they'll be like, yeah, I left that church because somebody said something that that bothered me or another Christian did something that surprised me and I was disappointed. I'm always like, really? Is that your idea of church? That's not how it works. All right, look at the person on your left. Just look to the people on your left. Look that way. Those people are messed up. They're broken. Now look at the people on your right. They're even more broken than the people on your left. That's fair. We are a broken and messed up people. We are not perfect. That's why we're here. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need church. And so what happens is when you take a group of people who are imperfect, who are growing in community, who are growing to look more like Jesus, either you're going to sin or somebody else is going to sin, or you're both going to sin. Things happen. But that's not intended to be the end of the relationship. That's why it's so important that we forgive others like Christ forgives us. It means that when someone falls, we don't end the game. We don't leave the church. We don't stop a relationship with that person. We help pick them back up. We forgive them even when they don't deserve it. Because remember, God forgave us even though We don't deserve it. That's how it works. And this kind of forgiveness is perfected in our love. Now, the word that Paul uses in our verses in verse 14 for love is agape. And agape is perfect or godly love. And that's the love that he calls us to in living with one another, to love one another with that kind of love. I I like how Peter talks about this in 1 Peter 4.8. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. When when we love each other the way Jesus loves us and the way we're called to love one another, you know, offenses go away quickly. They become less important. Things that we do that aren't perfect, they're just not important. We can reconcile with one another. We can continue to love and to serve and pick one another up because we are unified by this perfect love of Christ. See, these things that we're talking about This is the kind of church that we want to be. I'm excited about where we've been, but I'm even more excited about how we can do things differently and we can live even better and see what God does in us and through us in 2024. We we want to be a church that blows people away with our intentional grace. We, We want to be the kind of church that shares the love and the truth of Jesus, not because anyone deserves it, but because they have a desperate need for it. We want to be a church that's fully surrendered to God and to his plan for us as individuals and for us as a church. We we want to be a church that's so filled with God's love that we stand boldly against sin, but we forgive one another for that sin in a heartbeat. That we love one another and we live in the unity of Christ. You know, it's amazing to just kind of sit and think back to the beginning of the church and just look at all that God's accomplished through it. And Nathan, you know, I, I still remember sitting on a Zoom call with you in the summer of 2021 and talking with you when I was interviewing here. And, you know, at that point, the church had been around, I think, for like three months. And, you know, I remember sitting and talking with you and Lil about your heart and your vision behind why you planted Kara City. And, you know, you, pr- you know this at this point. Some of you may not know this. I mean, that really ultimately is what drew me here to come work here was, you know, I, I loved the fact that you didn't care about being a church that had modern and trendy worship. You didn't care about being a church that had, you know, relevant teaching and cool pastors or a big building or this massive church. What you cared about was that we showed the grace of God to others, and, and I loved that. Yeah, there's a real reason that I didn't want to focus on cool preachers. <laughs> I would have had to leave the church pretty quickly if that was the mission. The mission at Kara City has always been about showing intentional grace to others one person at a time. Sometimes I'll use this term lavish grace to describe the grace that God has for us and the grace that we're supposed to show to one another. 
It's a grace that ought to catch people off guard. It's a grace that ought to surprise us even when we show it to each other because it's just over the top. I'm excited about where we've been. I'm excited about how you guys love one another and love the community around you. I'm excited about how you serve one another. But I'm even more excited about what God's going to do this next year if we can do this message, if we can live this truth out. I just can't wait to see where our church is looking back this time next year. Yeah, and so this is the challenge, man, that you would make a commitment to live out the mission of intentional grace that we would take steps to grow in this in every area of our lives. And, and this is not just a mission for you. It's a mission that we are living out as a church staff. We are constantly talking about ways that we can grow and learn and continue to carry out this mission of intentional grace. And so thank you guys for being a part of that and for continuing in this mission with us. Because it's a simple goal, right? It's just not easy. And there's a lot of work to be done. But here's what I'll promise you. If we are faithful to the purpose and the calling that God has created and called us to, then he is faithful to do amazing things in us and through us as a church. And so the challenge is to live out these, these qualities that Paul gives us, that we would live with compassion and kindness, that we would live with humility, gentleness, and patience, that we would forgive one another, and above all else, that we would clothe ourselves with the love of God because it covers us, and it unifies us. And man, if we will do that, you'll be blown away by what God's gonna do this year. Let's pray.